I'm very happy tonight to introduce Mike Bonkowski to the Nanaimo Historical Society. Um, I learned of Mike's work via his YouTube videos of the ENN Railroad and its subdivisions, where I think he's come close now to have having hiked every section while delivering nearly a tie-by-tie -tie description of uh, the now lonesome and languishing routes, trestles, and crossings. Mike is a lifelong Vancouver Islander whose interest in its built environment and transportation history was piqued uh, through family field trips and his father's running commentary about this, that, and why along the way. A chartered professional accountant by uh, profession is now in remission, I think. Almost. Seven Almost. more months. Okay. <laughs> Mike's new passion is to take the world along on his own field trips and outings via the wonder of YouTube, by rail, and also by sea, with an equal interest in um, BC maritime heritage when coastal steamships and workboats linked our isolated settlements. But he's here tonight to put the Nanaimo Historical Society and its audience on track regarding the... Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> I don't do this every day. <laughs> Regarding the topographical and engineering challenges presented during the construction of the e &N. Please welcome Mike Bonkowski. Thanks. We'll just check the voice and see how it's going. If I talk at this level, it works great, Sue. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you to Daryl for this opportunity. He basically just um, summarized our Tim Hortons coffee discussion from mid-October and where we were attempting to translate my quirky niche interest in things into something that could work as a general talk. So a few things about me, four things. Um, I really like railway history. I find it interesting. I, I like railway history. I like ENN history. I grew up in South Wellington, uh, just south of Nanaimo, where we could set our clocks by hearing the horn on the dayliner in the morning and at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. I also love making photographs and videos and presenting them in a creative way, but still paying attention to what I call nerdy. I think it's the second time I've used that word. We'll get up to about 100 on that. Uh, the details of the infrastructure, I find it really fascinating and along the way I've tried to learn about what I'm seeing and uh, sometimes I get the details right and sometimes I'm still learning. Um, I do hope that trains will run again. I believe that trains should run again but that's not the focus of this talk but that's that's where I am with that um, and I've got a bit of a card catalog brain and so the facts are all up there, and um, I just have to draw them out. So let's take a look, and we'll see how smooth we can be here. We'll start with context. Vancouver Island, on the west coast of British Columbia, and the yellow squiggles are railways. And at the top of the island, that's the old Englewood Logging Railway, which actually was um, sh uh, shut down in 2017 and removed in 2020. But it still shows up on my railway map, and I like that, even though it's gone. And the ENN railway is Victoria up to Courtney and Parksville over to Port Alberni. Here's a close-in look at southeast Vancouver Island. So the yellow squiggle, all those little yellow squares are actually mile posts all scrunched together. So railways mark... Their, their distances in miles, and if all the signs are up, there is a post every single mile. And on some of the structures, there's a like a 17.5 marker and stuff. So they get really precise. But for the map, it shows you where things are. So the ENN is broken into two subdivisions currently. Victoria subdivision goes from Victoria up to Courtney. So it's 139 and a bit miles. That translates roughly to 223 kilometers. And if you took the highways, you'd be about 219 kilometers. And so the railway uh, distance and the road distance is pretty comparable. Not so much for the Port Alberni subdivision. It's about 38 kilometers from Parksville Station to Port Alberni Station. 
that's about 62 kilometers. And the roads are only about 46 if you took Highway 4 and Redford down into Port Alberni. And that's because there's geography involved. There's a mountain range. There's the Beaufort Range. There's Cameron Lake. And so the railway needs to snake around. Also a good time to give you a little bit of the history. The Victoria subdivision last saw um, passenger rail activity in 2011. And that was with VIA, the Dayliner. And it was about 2013, 2014, when the various non-Nanaimo freight customers last ran. And the last few of those was there was a pole plant, like telephone poles, utility poles out of wood, um, south of Courtney. There is a silicates plant in Parksville, in the industrial park, and top shelf feeds in Duncan. Those were the last three big. Of course, there's still superior propane in uh, middle Nanaimo. And usually about three times a week, the train will still run from the waterfront uh, rail yard that's called Wellcox to Superior Propane with uh, some full cars of propane. It'll move them around a bit and head on back. And I think in recent weeks that hasn't happened that much because they're um, still getting back on track ha, 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 after a labor issue with the tugboats where the tugboats weren't running for a bit. Port Alberni subdivision, however, last regular train was in late 2001. And so that's coming up to 21 years. So it's longer. And their last, um, they were primarily a freight, and it was the mill, it was the pulp mill that switched to trucks in that era. Uh, what else do we need to say about that? Well, so I call this a paused moment in railway history. It's Kind of like your VCR, it's on pause, except we don't necessarily know when the pause button's gonna get hit again and it'll start playing again, or if the stop button will get hit. And um, for me as a historian, it's an interesting time because there's certainty looking backwards, and this is like anything in history, and there's uncertainty and unknowns looking forwards. Um, so Part of my motivation is to um, document as much as I can, and in the best case scenario, when trains start to run again, I'll have a nice photo and video record of how things were um, during this weird period. There's a bit of a closer look. In the Port Alberni subdivision, from Parksville to Port Alberni, really does snake around the mountains, and the Victoria to Courtney is far more straight. So there's me, the cover photo, that's near the Port Alberni summit in a rock cut, doing what I enjoy doing. Good time to mention the Island Corridor Foundation is the owner of the ENN, and I actually do have their permission to be on the tracks in a respectful, responsible way, but obviously staying away from any train activity, so I'm not going to be doing that in Chase River when trains are running, um, and being on Vancouver Island can teach some bad habits because if I go to the mainland, they have big trains that are big, fast, and you don't go near the tracks on those. Um, but I do have a great relationship with Island Corridor Foundation, the railway owner. Uh, they appreciate my work and it helps keep the railway in the public's awareness. And so that helps. And that's one of the things that I just enjoy doing is just, yes, we have a railway. and. Um, so let's talk about our first subsection of the talk, which is obstacles. So this is a trestle. This is near Port Alberni. So railways like to go level uh, because trains operate efficiently when you've got a large number of rail cars pulled by a few locomotives. And it's just start it slowly as if you were riding a one gear bike and get that momentum going. And so they don't like ups and downs. A severe ups and downs and so but geography is not like that we have things like canyons ravines uh, river valleys uh, creeks rivers uh, gullies and even cliffs and so the railway has a few choices to go somewhere else but if that's really the most efficient way to 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 route the line you can change the landscape by putting in a bunch of dirt and rock fill and holding it in with a retaining wall that's done or you can go above and build, build a railway in the sky like that. And that's a trestle or a bridge span. So a bit of history um, looking while we're looking at the sun coming over Mount Aerosmith at Summit Lake near Port Alberni. 
1886 is the magic date when the ENN opens from E to N, Esquimalt to Nanaimo. Three years later, Robert Dunsmuir passes away. And afterwards, um, the simplest way for me to explain is James Dunsmuir, his son, was the main controlling voice of the ENN railway. So, the first generation of a lot of the structures of bridges and trestles were made out of timber because it was simple, quick, easier to do. Timber has a finite life, so it's going to have a shelf life of a couple of decades. And also, timber structures aren't as strong as steel or iron structures, but they're the way to go easy at the start. So, once you get 20 years in, so we're in that 19, coming up to 1905, um, the railway knew they'd have some upgrades needed to the structures, either rebuild a bunch of timber or replace with steel and iron, which would cost money. Because another thing that was happening is during this rapidly changing railway time in history, things were getting bigger, things were getting heavier. And so the railway locomotive of 1886 was not the railway locomotive of 1905. It was larger, more powerful, heavier. And so it needed stronger structures. So perhaps that was one of the uh, motivating factors for Dunsmuir's to sell to Canadian Pacific Railway, 1905. And by 1909, many of the bridges on the ENN were in fact replaced in this early CPR era. CPR, besides having a coast to coast railway, had all sorts of branch lines across Canada with a lot of um, steel and iron bridges in their inventory that they were replacing and upgrading, um, but the old ones would be an upgrade for the ENN. So we'll talk about that when we talk about bridges in a few more slides. And then a few more dates. Um, the ENN made it to Port Alberni in 1911, Lake Cowichan in 1912, Courtney in 1914, and for those who want to be really technical, it also made it to Great Central Lake. And uh, that was the first one that was then sort of abandoned later in the 50s. And it made it to Osborne Bay, known as Crofton, as well. Here's the music. So this is Nanaimo River. Oh, are we so far so good with volume and stuff? Awesome. Nanaimo River, I'm standing on the highway bridge looking upstream. And the railway bridge is in the foreground. And in the background, up behind, is what I still call the bungee zone bridge. So. The railway bridge is on a narrow canyon, so there's a lot of vertical space between the railway deck and the water level. And if boats, small boats, wanted to navigate, there's a lot of room for them to go underneath the bridge. And the bridge needs a truss to strengthen it because it's just a straight shot across a canyon. And so it needs a truss. And so the simplest thing is to put the truss below the deck, not above the deck. That's the simplest thing. So we call that a deck truss. That's what it looks like from up above, which is not all that exciting. It's a bit scary, but not all that exciting. The action's down below. So there's the truss looking from the north bank, and a really interesting metal work that's got that green color, which if I were a scientist, I'd explain that it might have something to do with oxidation or something. Um, but this is one of the 1909 ones that came from elsewhere on the CPR. As a photographer, I find this kind of detail just really fascinating, really pleasing and interesting. Just all that busy detail, like looking just down the truss like that and just seeing all that. So this is the kind of stuff that really gets me going. I love it. There's below the structure looking to the other side and you can see the masonry tower on the far side of the canyon holding it up. So that's a deck truss. All the truss stuff is below. Let's compare that to this, Shamanus River. So Shamanus River is not a tall canyon. It's a wide and uh, short um, vertical space between the railway grade and the water level. And of course, as we found out a year ago, the water level can get up pretty high. And so there's not gonna be room to have any truss work below the railway deck. And in fact, there wouldn't even be room then for boats, um, small boats to navigate up and down. So what do you do? You build above. And so this is what they call a through truss, presumably because you drive the train through the truss. It's a lot more interesting. This is also one of the 1909 ones that either came from somewhere else or was just fabricated for that. I'm not sure. 
Anyway, that's Shemanus River, and that's how it looks looking just straight on down. One of the couple interesting things that's going to be common to a few of these is on the left side, there's a pipe. And that pipe is a utility um, conduit. And so I've, inside that is maybe TELUS wires or maybe Shaw wires. But when it's not going across a bridge or a trestle, it's buried underground next to it. But you don't want to bury under the water, so it comes up through the pipe. That's just interesting. Also, the four rails. So it's not so you can have a small train in the middle. The narrow rails in the middle are the guardrail. Um, industry calls that a Jordan rail. Um, and that's so if a train is on the structure and happens to derail, so some of the wheels leave the main track, they're going to get stuck in between those extra guardrails, which prevents the train from boom, falling off the structure down a steep ravine or into the water. So you see those on almost everything. It's just one of those interesting things that I eventually learned. We're inside the cage looking down at Shimanus River. So that's just inside with all that interesting metal work, which again, it's the photography in me, in me finds it really fascinating and it's interesting engineering. Let's go down south a bit further. So this is Cowichan River. Again, this is not a narrow, tall canyon. This is a wide, uh, short vertical space. And so it's begging for a uh, through truss with a truss work above. This one's kind of special. This is one of the 1909 ones, but this one was fabricated in 1876, uh, and the manufacturer was Phoenix, Phoenix Iron Works in the States. It's a Whipple truss, and it was originally at the St. Maurice River in Quebec in the CPR system, and it was twice as long. So when they moved it to the Cowichan River, they doubled it up. So there's two trusses on either side, which presumably means it is twice as strong, or something like that. But that's the end on view. Looking north, just again, interesting metal work. And there inside the cage there, you can just see all those opposing strands of, of metal, which just to me, again, is really fascinating. Um, structures are interesting. And again, the engineering is pretty remarkable. Let's go a bit further south. That's the Coxilla River, just south of city of Duncan in autumn. Uh, a few years ago, and interesting, beautiful structure. Here's a close-up look. So pony walls, pony truss, which is like a half wall on either side, and then it's got those hoops that connect either side, and I kind of call them pic picnic basket handles. That is not the name for it, but that's kind of what it looks like. But again, there's not any vertical clearance below, so you can't put any of the structure below, so it's got to be above. And if you wonder what it looked like at night under a bunch of stars with my headlamp on, for like 10 seconds during a long exposure. That's what it looks like. Interesting, uh, lots of creative opportunities on that. Here's something different. French Creek between Parksville and Qualicum on the ENN main line. This crosses a really wide gully valley with just a narrow French Creek channel partway through. But it's mainly a wide gully. So this is the longest structure on the entire ENN system at just over 1,000 feet, about 324 meters. And not remarkable looking from the top, other than it's just a big runway to the sky, it looks like. But below is where the interesting stuff is. And so just the part that crosses above the creek, you've got steel towers on either side and a steel deck plate girder. Not the most exciting structure but it allows you to um, basically bridge the gap where the water is. Here's the interesting stuff. On either side of the gully, just a massive timber frame trestle structure. It's really similar to what you'd see at Kinshole Trestle near Shawnigan Lake. Um, pretty amazing. Um, I'll get you a better photo here. Uh, just the, the size of it all. And um, it's interesting. It, it's, timber is finite. I, I, I mentioned that. It's got a, a, a limited life. Um, this had a significant rebuild done between seven, 1975 and 1977. They redid this, and they redid one further up island at Sable River near Fannie Bay. And it was two year, just over a two year project. And um, so during that time, their train service only went as far north as Parksville. And I've seen photographs of the first train, like the first dayliner back to Courtney in late 1977 with the people, just like us, you know, with the signs and the banners of saying, welcome back. Um, so that's French Creek. 
really interesting being that close to a big structure. So that takes us to part two of the talk, which is my particular area of affection, the Port Alberni line from Parksville to Port Alberni. And I like it because it's got lots of interesting geography and I would like the out in the woods type of stuff. So from left to right, it doesn't start all that exciting. And, and from my point of view, and something exciting is something with hard engineering and lots of obstacles. If it's smooth going and efficient, that's not so exciting for the photographs, but it's, it's a better case. It's not about me. It's about the railway. Um, but going through Arrington, Coombs, Hilliers, Whiskey Creek, and to Little Qualcomm Falls Park is pretty straightforward. But then it gets interesting. So I'll show you that zoomed in. So there's Cameron Lake on the right-hand side. And there's Port Alberni at the bottom left. And the red line is the railway route. And this is why I find it so fascinating. It just goes, snakes around. And so right at the beginning at Cameron Lake, it's on the North Shore, which is where the automobile road used to be before the railway. Um, it just starts gaining elevation continuously at a nice sort of steady pace of slope going up goes above camp above um, Cathedral Grove and Macmillan Provincial Park on the slope makes the turn down at the bottom in the middle of this map that's the same sharp turn that Highway 4 does when you're driving to Port Alberni and they have the super dividers and you're caught behind a semi truck and you do these long turns that never end that's going up and then when we're on the other side of the hump it's a gradual downhill but Port Alberni train station is the destination at sea level, so you've got a long downhill to do, nice and gradual. And so you go up past McLean Mill towards Bainbridge in the Beaver Creek neighborhood, and then it makes a nice sharp turn and brings itself back to Port Alberni. That's the interesting geography of just how these routes go and why is a train going the wrong way. Interesting fact. Um, in railway language, uh, your direction that you're going is essentially the direction of your final destination. So from Parksville, or from Port Alberni back to Parksville is eastward, because you're going to the east side of the island. Even though you're starting out going north, and then you go down southeast a little bit, and then back north, it's just simple. It's railway east or railway west. Zoom in to Port Alberni area, and the purple line is highways and roads, taking you from Loon Lake at the Alberni summit, to Port Alberni, but let's contrast this. There's the yellow, and that's the railway, so you can see it's quite further to go. This is where I say, is that my water? Yes, perfect. Good time for a drink. Okay, this is where we start some photographs. Thanks for putting through, putting up with the maps. Um, just to give you, again, my particular area that I really enjoy is the Port Alberni line, especially Cameron Lake to about McLean Mill. That does it for me. Um, Left-hand side, a bit of a timeline. The last train from the mill, late 2001, and then a few weeks later in early 2002, they brought out, I think, the mill switcher locomotive. The era between 2002, 2016, there was periodic brushing and obstacle clearing by various authorized volunteer groups that was going on. On the right hand side, those kinds of obstacles is just the truth. Nature is always pushing back. And you really see that on a railway that doesn't have active maintenance going on. Um, rock slides, windfall trees, trees and plants growing in from the side, trees growing in the middle. Um, broom weeds, oh yeah, I don't like broom with ticks, ah, good thing. And rotting wood on wooden trestles, those are the various challenges that nature's always going against you. The most recent official event on this line was 2016. It was a speeder tour. Speeders are those little putt-putt uh, gasoline or diesel two-person rail cars. And there's groups in North America where the collectors have them and they have a club and they take them on their trucks and go to uh, lightly used railways across North America and do two or three day tours for fun. So there was a, t a speeder event in 2016 on Vancouver Island included here. They went out to McLean Mill and back. 2021 and 2022, um, there was some brush and obstacle clearing done um, because Shaw was putting in a fiber optic cable alongside the railway for eight miles of it. And boy, what a difference in being able to walk and have sight lines again and being able to see around the corners um, and get a glimpse of what the railway could look like if it was 
fully operational again. And then the, the um, sort of just a casual comment at the bottom left is that there's just been ongoing informal clearing of obstacles by people that happen to use it for hiking or mountain biking or ATVs perhaps, people that carry chainsaws or saws with them and sometimes it's quite quick. You see a windfall one week and if you're back in that area the next week it's been limbed or it's been cut on either side and pushed out of the way. So that's just that informal thing which you're not going to see on the Victoria to Courtney. This is, again, it's got 10 more years in the Port Alberni line of, of no trains and so it's kind of, it's still there um, but it's got that interesting sort of out of the way feel to it. So let's take you on a little bit of a photo tour and show you what it looks like because this is what you kind of see, some of it maybe from the road but this is where we start um, climbing at Cameron Lake. So this is the first lake view trestle at Cameron Lake and the uh, highway is on the far side and that angel rock, like the cutout rock on Highway 4 that you used to have to like duck to get through is pretty much opposite there. But that's their first trestle along the lake and so we're seeing bits of the lake. That's a nice lake view uh, part way down the lake with um, bright middle of the day autumn colors. Again the Highway 4 is on the opposite side and the railway is quite a ways above the lake. Here's a view from the highway. This is the big trestle, mile 14.6. It is the magnificent one. It is, uh, I don't have the height. I thought I, thought I had the height and the length on there. 1953 was the last time it had a full rebuild. It did some repair work in the 70s and they probably replaced timber as it was needed up until the 1990s era. And I'll show you a few more views of this from there. There's the view from the trestle looking westward at Cameron Lake. It's a pretty cool structure. Um, same structure, you can get an idea of the height looking down there, but here, here is where I am, right beside it. Pretty impressive, and it's kind of like a multi-story building with, the, uh, with the, the timber frame stuff. I think they call those bents. So a section of timber frames is a bent, B-E-N-T. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it's like a multi-story building. And then a close in of just all that timber just engineered to be exactly where it needs to be, ignoring the fact that it's getting old and was due for replacement probably like 20 years ago. Um, but what an interesting structure. There's me, um, back end of the lake. Back end meaning the northwest corner of Cameron Lake, above the lake. Um, in the hard to get to spots, the spots that um, hikers that are going up to Mount Horn and Mount Wesley uh, will go past this area a bit. Um, but this is kind of in the hard to get to, and I like it there because it's pretty darn peaceful and pretty beautiful in autumn. And there are trestles that are kind of hidden away back there, uh, timber frame trestles. And again, autumn, this is autumn 2019, and I got it on a rainy morning. And so the wood is looking nice and beautiful for the camera. And I wanted to see that kind of color again this year. And I went twice with about two and a half week gap between them. And I was still too early because of the weird uh, delayed autumn that we had in terms of the leaves taking forever to turn color. But I was able to do that hike in shorts and t-shirt in mid-October. It's another structure. Just looking at the clock, we're still okay. We're quarter to eight. Um, Another structure pretty much above Cathedral Grove on the slope, above uh, McMillan Provincial Park. Um, the bridge nerd in me goes, oh yeah, that's like a depth, uh, half depth steel girder bridge with a couple trestle approaches on either side. And it's just bridging a, a dry ravine. But again, just all sorts of interesting structures there that need maintenance and uh, but are interesting to look at. Big magnificent rock cut blasted out. And um, so a lot of the Cameron Lake to McLean Mill area of the railway is a pretty steep slope and where you blast out the rock, you get enough room for an even ledge on the bottom to put your railway and then just a little bit, it drops off again going down. In this case, going down to Highway 4 um, near the Cameron River. I find it interesting. Of course, the rock is really beautiful. Yeah, the, the photographer in me likes this. Why I like this stuff. I mean, it's the photographer, it's the history, 
It's knowing a few things about the engineering and appreciating it. And um, yeah, and knowing that starting in 1911, steam engines were going through here. Pretty interesting. So we're getting closer to the Alberni summit. There's Mount Aerosmith, uh, straight down the middle. This is mile 20.2, just before it takes the big curve to go up the hump, and the curve is at the end. So the Port Alberni line has a lot of wooden structures. The Victoria to Courtney line used to, but that whole 1909 um, era of replacing with steel um, has made most of them steel. There's a few wooden ones like the French Creek, big trestle part. But here's where the highway is, right beside the railway. And when the trees are cleared, and if you're not in springtime with lots of leaves, you can see it if you know when to look when you're climbing up the hump, coming up the east side, going up towards the summit. And the railway is pretty close. The railway is at its steepest on the entire ENN, right around there. It gets up to 2.2% grade, which is uh, not all that great. Um, and just before that, it's 2.0 and 2.1. But it, it is quite steep. And it's interesting because the highway, of course, can go crazy. Sue, there's a per person at the door. There's a white Toyota four-door with its lights on. A white Toyota four-door or forerunner. OK. Um, the road has the luxury of just going straight. The railway has to take it easy. And this is that time where they're almost at the same elevation. Just before that, the road is below the railway. And just around the corner, obviously, the railway is below the road. And the railway curves through. And this is where they just got the dynamite out and blasted through the rock to keep that even sort of gradual in, um, slope, which takes us to there, the cover shot um, with the rock on either side with the over 100 years of moss growing and all those lovely ferns. And that's an area that gets a lot of water runoff. And so it's always mushy, squishy soil um, with grass growing. But that takes us to the Port Alberni Summit area, one of my favorite spots on the whole island, Summit Lake. The Port Alberni people will call that Dog Lake or Junior Lake. Um, there's a lot of things in the railway that have different names, um, which is interesting. The railway can name their, name their landmarks whatever they want. It's just on their internal records. So near Fanny Bay, the railway has a creek called Mill Creek on their records with the Mill Creek Railway Bridge. The highway sign calls it Cowie Creek or Cougar Creek or Cougar Smith Creek. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different variations. Uh, north of Ladysmith, right where there's the Stolo uh, development and the Microtel Hotel, um, there's a railway bridge behind there. And the railway calls that Harrison Creek, and the highway signs call it Bush Creek. So there's all these multi-names. Anyway, I call this Summit Lake. But this is looking at that lovely Mount Aerosmith. This is last early December. Uh, I got the photograph I was looking for, the snow and the morning sun hitting the one side and giving you the melt, but not yet on the other side. So pretty gorgeous. And trains could go through here. It's just a little ways past that. It's crossing a swamp, getting closer to Loon Lake. So we're still at the Alberni summit. And that's the longest structure on the Port Alberni subdivision, just basic trestle that goes across the swamp. And it looks like that from the side, um, just timber piles. and. I kind of think that if that were, had been a busier railway, they would have got rid of the trestle and got a bunch of dirt fill and rock and filled in basically a grade, a built up grade and ran the railway on that because that's what they've done in a whole lot of other places. But for whatever reason, probably just the level of activity, they kept it as a timber pile trestle, which means it needs to be maintained and uh, continually worked on. And it's interesting when you look close, closely, if, you, if you're on it looking down, you can see where the last generation of timber piles has been cut off. So there's the stumps in the water and then the, the current generation of timber piles beside them. Working our way now on the west side of the summit. And uh, I love this kind of a scene. I mean, this is all west coast stuff that I love. You've got a rock cut in the background with different colors and textures to it. You've got that moss, you've got the lichens, the ferns, the neat trees. You've got the Alberni fog, which is a real thing. 
and it just makes an interesting scene that I find interesting. So again, this is just bringing it back to context. This is things you don't see unless you're hiking through, hiking through the woods, and it's just part of that interesting route to get to Port Alberni, which is why I find it interesting. And the people in 19, before 1911 were mapping out the route. We're like, okay, this will work. Here's a way to do it. Boggles my mind how they do that without and without computers that doing a simulation of, well, if we start going down this direction and we need to be at a certain elevation for a summit, you know, 15 miles away, which way do we go? And then you, yeah, it's, that's why they're engineers. This lovely trestle is above Coombs Country Candy Store, which is at the east side of Port Alberni, and it's below the Alberni Lookout popular hiking uh, destination and so it's just continue we're continuing the wrong way um, steadily losing elevation there's a view at that same spot up on the rocks and Beaver Creek neighborhood is there on the left and if the Alberni fog and low cloud wasn't there you'd get a little peekaboo view of Great Central Lake but the railway on the right hand side is just continuing on going the wrong way gradually losing elevation and lots of interesting colored moss so continuing there, there's scenes like this. Take the Alberni fog, take some jagged rocks, you gotta add some windfall trees, and then just that uh, overgrowth that's starting to encroach from either side. And oh yeah, let's add some moss to the trees and just make a really neat mystic scene. When, if trains start to run again, obviously this is where you need to do a whole lot of brushing and cleanup. Um, but it's interesting looking at it and just going, yeah, that's a neat scene where you can see the history. You can see that it's a railway grade. You understand the history of that it's been 21 years since trains ran, so it's going to look a bit haggard like that, but you can still see the rails and the ties to let you know this was a transportation route, and it's still owned as a transportation route. So, but there's just so much pleasing to my eye, at least, in this. And you break out into areas where you can see some of the mountains near Port Alberni and uh, get some sunshine. And look in the opposite direction. I like this one here because you can look on the left and see the Alberni Inlet if you had this really big blowing up. But there's the pulp mill smoke there. And you see the railway just continuing on. Again, still the wrong way. Continuing to lose elevation. Takes a long time. And you go through other rock cuts like that that are just kind of amazing where they blasted through and um, it's just going through this man-made rock canyon with some interesting sound deadening caused by the rocks on either side. And you get scenes like this as well. So this is a continual rockfall area um, where if you look at the rocks on the right, some of them have an awful lot of moss on them telling you that they fell a while ago. And then there's other ones that don't have moss on them yet. And just for good measure, let's throw in a big arbutus limb. But there's problem areas. Again, that's an engineering challenge. Lots of problem areas um, that just can need continual kind of pushing back against nature, which is pushing back against you. Above Cameron Lake, I don't have a photo of this here, but above Cameron Lake, there on the mountain slope, when you, if you're driving Highway 4 and you do the quick glance up, um, there's part of the mountainside that you can see there was, a, there was a dirt slide or rock slide or something from right near the top going down. And there are some big boulders right in the middle of the railway. Um, hopefully they didn't bounce and then go down because the cabins along Cameron, Cameron Lake are below that. And that was from just about a year ago. One of those things where you get a super droughty summer not a word, but you know what I mean. Not a lot of rain, and then trees get weak, um, everything gets brittle, and then you get a bunch of rain, and things kind of break loose. Interesting. Again, I, I find anything interesting, it's even if it's chaos like that. It just looks interesting. Speaking of that, this is a neat structure. They call this a track culvert. Um, so this is where a creek is, a seasonally running creek. So I've been there when it's been dry empty like that, and I've been there when there's water flowing from behind where I'm standing. And instead of doing a conventional culvert um, that you bury, and instead of doing a very, very short bridge, they decided to do this 
structure of some concrete abutments which kind of look like piano keys and just put the ties on top of those and run the railway across and it's just as strong, just as sound and looks kind of interesting. Just the weird things you see in the woods there. And the detail person in me even loves just the different shapes of the nuts on the tie joiner plate in the middle of the, the picture there. We got the diamonds, the circles, the squares. Here's a timber frame trestle. This is above McLean Mill, so we're getting our way towards Port Alberni. Don't worry, we're almost done. Um, and they actually number each of the bent sections for engineering purposes, and this goes up to about 18 or so, but that's the look from below. Again, it's basically a railway grade in the sky because you have a gully that you need to go across, and that's what it looks like from above, looking back, nice curve. And so again, this is, there's a lot of photogenic, interesting things that you don't see from the road. And we've made our big turn, and we're coming back towards Port Alberni, and so the Beaufort Slope, the Beaufort Range is in the background. On the right, it has an eerie look, and it kind of looks like something you'd see pictures of for Remembrance Day. Um, but that's recently logged, and those are just all replanted trees with their casings. But it has that interesting look. And we're back at Smith Road, um, Beaver Creek neighborhood of Port Alberni, working our way back to Port Alberni. We get to Kitsuxis Creek, which has a nice sort of uh, canyon dike area park to walk across. But if you look closely on the left side underneath, you see that steel truss, and that's kind of interesting. So it's a, a truss bridge with that steel truss hidden below with all that engineering in there. And you're at Port Alberni at their rail yard, and just around the corner at the far end will be the Alberni train station. So that's my photo tour of this part. I got one more section for you. Um, and, but that was the big, the big section, just to sort of show you the landscape and the things I find interesting. So, the railway has obstacles, also roads as well. Sometimes the railway is an obstacle to the road. Um, so this is Haslam Creek, Spruceton Road, Highway 1 in the background. And from the railway's point of view, nothing exciting. The railway was there, road comes in later, has to figure out how they're going to deal with it. And so from the railway's point of view, this is an underpass because the, um, the road is going under the railway but it looks more interesting from Spruceton Road. Interesting, but scary too if you're driving um, with that blind, narrow corner. But hey, look at that on the left. There's one of those deck trusses. That one's from 1911. Let's go closer. It's pretty darn interesting. Just again, that I find the metal work pretty fascinating. And again, yeah, 1911 era, it's been there. Here's one that a lot of us in Nanaimo seen that we have near Chase River just south of the Bold Night restaurant. Here's the propane train, which generally again goes three times a week. Um, and this is part of the spur line that connects the waterfront rail yard to the main ENN over by 10th Street. And those of you who've been here since the 70s, like me, remember that originally it was just one bridge, not two bridges, because it was a two-lane highway. And some of you might also remember that on the other side, there was a famous spray-painted uh, few words that said, kiss me, Pierre. And uh, what I heard is that happened sometime before a visit from the then Prime Minister in the 1970s. I just remember as a kid always seeing kiss me, Pierre, when we were going under the bridge on our way to turn off to go over to Harewood. Um, but there is that. There's the same bridge looking at it from the corner with uh, Rexall there on the left hand side. Here's some interesting color. There's the head on view of that Chase River Bridge. And it's the fresh ties that were installed there, and they are yellow cedar, and they just give a nice visual look. Dumont Road. Not a great photograph. It's dark. That's why they call me Low Light Mike, I guess. Um, but again, road is underpassing. Here's a closer look. Simple as it gets. It's just timber all the way through. And there's just timber piles. And the middle one is encased in concrete so those pesky cars don't destroy the structure. But, and from above, eh, it kind of looks like that. How about that for a nice autumn scene? This is Cowichan Station. So this is south of Duncan, north of Cobble Hill. And if you continue on the road down, you cross a lovely Howe Truss one-lane road bridge over the Coke Sila River. 
the church. Perhaps it was recycling day that day when I was there. And um, nothing too thrilling about the bridge from this angle, but wait, it gets better. There's the peekaboo view from uh, Coxila Road. 2.9 meters clearance, kind of short. And all of that stonework is pretty cool. And the stonework was quarried in um, Cobble Hill area. There's a view of it from below. Again, that 2.9 meters. And if you're a bigger, taller vehicle, you're taking the bypass, which is just a short bypass, aptly called CPR Road. And here's our last bridge. This is Seanigan Lake Road. And um, again, nothing too thrilling from up above at railway level because the railway is just having a simple time. It's the road that's got to deal with the obstacle. Oh, it's 3.4 meters. This is a real tall one compared to the last one. But this still requires a detour for taller vehicles to go around the backside of Seanigan Lake. And there's that stonework on the abutments. And again, I think that's from the Cobble Hill Quarry. So just to take us to present day, this is from a couple years ago, but again, a few times a week, the train will bring some propane cars from the waterfront to Superior Propane, which is further down that way. And when it wants to go back, this is where it's kind of like playing a chess game. When it wants to go back, you gotta get the locomotives to the other end of the train. And you can't just pick them up, and they can't just, do they have to have a spot where there's two tracks. Well, wouldn't you know that just on the other side of this Wellington overpass is a second track, it's a siding, the Wellington siding, just by Nanaimo Chrysler. And so the um, train pulls in there, the locomotives unhook and go a bit further, come back on this siding, and come to the other end, and hook up, and then take it back down south. Which is fascinating, again, for the little boy in me who likes things that move and just figuring out where things go. It is kind of like a chess game. You've got to figure out what's your move going to be and where can you do that and where are you lined up. Oh, that's the last slide. That means we're done. Um, so that's me at one of the interesting old uh, trestles above Cathedral Grove. So on social media, I call myself Low Light Mike. I just decided that was an interesting nickname. I do YouTube videos, um, and they're all under that Low Light Mike name. Flickr is for really good photographs. Thank you to Jim in the audience for getting me on to Flickr like a few years ago, telling me it was the way to go, and it sure is. It's the polar opposite of the next one on the list, <laughs> the Instagram. Um, and then there's that thing called Facebook that sometimes is a good place to be, and Sometimes isn't. Um, but that's what I do for fun and enjoyment. So that is the end of the exciting presentation. I hope it was exciting. Yes? Um, Excuse the, me. Yeah. Can I ask you to talk into the mic for questions? Um, and all the wooden trestles, yeah. uh, is the wood treated at all? Some of it is, in fact, that's the way to go, is to have it creosote treated, but there are some of them, like this one, um, where when they did the last rebuild, and they, meaning, I think it was Canadian Pacific in the late 80s or so, I think they knew they were gonna wanna sell, and they did untreated timbers for part of it, and they're just disintegrating now. But mostly treated, that would be the way to go. Um, I think yellow cedar has some natural way of being way better. I think. Um, Mike, my wife and I were hiking a month or so ago uh, up uh, in Nile Creek area. Yeah. And we found ourselves under the railway bridge there and found a date, construction date, yeah. I assume, 1925. Okay. Yeah. So does that mean there was a timber bridge there initially? I'm assuming there was probably um, because that was Courtney. So the Courtney line was completed in 1914, just in time for the war. And so you'd think there would have been one, uh, like a timber one originally, I'm assuming. I don't know for sure. It's where I dig into my Robert Turner books to find out. But I mean, Nile Creek, really similar to, there's one up near Union Bay, um, Hart Creek, 
the railway calls it Washer Creek, same sort of thing, it looks really the same. Interesting thing is some of those up in that area had logging railways that went underneath them. So you'd have the creek and then you'd have a little bit of a, a creek bank, enough room to have a logging railway work its way from the woods down to say Deep Bay um, and uh, room for that underneath. Um, uh, that's way more stuff, but yeah. Yeah, I guess the reason I was yeah. curious is because yeah. I would have thought that was built by the CPR yeah. and that they would have built that line with permanent structures yeah. right from the yeah. get-go. Yeah, you'd think so. So, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, thanks Jim. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that the uh, Lake Cowichan line opened in 1912. Do you know when it closed? Um, when was the last train? I'm gonna say some, this is a, a approximate, I think the late 80s or the early 90s, I think. And in fact, when the Corridor Foundation took over it, I think it was still part of the, the railway lands and then they actually abandoned it, I think, because it's part of Couchin Valley Regional District Trail. But I think it was then. It went to, I mean, the interesting thing was there's two different railways, like Canadian National went up from uh, like Souk, Shawnigan Lake, Kinsole, Trestle to Lake Cowichan and then Yubo on its route. And CP just took the shot from behind what's now the Walmart um, up through um, Paldi, Satlam um, to Lake Cowichan right near where the station is now, I think. But yeah, I'm, I'm not, I missed, I wish I could have a time. Maybe this is a common historical thing where you're like, if I only had a time machine and I could find the stuff that I'm interested in now and see pictures of in a book and I see faint bits of evidence on the ground, but can I get in my TARDIS and go back and actually see it? Um, I did. I did, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So Hi, I have the mic, Mike. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a stonemason. I've been uh, investigating the origin of stone along the CPR main line. Yeah. Uh, and I've just started doing the same locally. The bridges I've looked at so far have sandstone blocks, which I assume came out of our harbor here in Nanaimo. Okay. Now, have you found the quarry, you say, the stone near uh, Shawnigan Lake? I haven't. I've read about that through either Shawnigan Lake History Museum stuff, and I'm not sure if that's the quarry that people swim in. So there was a marble quarry yeah. there, which isn't okay. suitable for yeah. bridge construction. So I'm not sure so exactly. So yeah. it would take an examination of those blocks yeah. at the, the road underpass yeah. to be sure. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a few in a row. There's Coke Silo Road. There's Northgate Road, which is just north of Shawnigan Yes, Lake. I know. And then there's them. the three bridges on Shawnigan Creek by the pub. I'll check that for yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Next. I love the ability to be imprecise when I need to be where it's. Uh, I see on the wooden trestles there's cantilevered platforms. Yeah. Can you speak as to what those are for? So mainly, I used to call them refuge bays because I saw them called out on an engineering report and I was like, okay, that's where you go. Where, oops, I'm doing a stand by me moment. I'm stuck on a trestle, train's coming, let's get, but. I'm now calling them fire barrel platforms because they generally all held fire barrels. And even the trestle at Somonos Lake on the Forest Discovery Center's uh, railway line has got two or three of those um, sticking out with a water barrel. Um, so it's just a place to have fire water, water for a possible sparked fire close by. That's the main thing. They also disintegrate pretty quick. There's a few of them. I found one of them. Um, there's one above McLean Mill that actually has the fire barrel the, um, still on that platform. All the other ones have all been kicked off or fallen off, and some of them you can see in the ground below, but yeah. Any more questions yet? Now, if I recall correctly, McLean Mill does some historical train stuff. Did they ever use the um, line through there for, like, historical tourist trains and that sort of thing? They went as far as, um, well, so they, they started at Port Alberni's train station at the waterfront and they went to the McLean Mill Spur is kind of right near Smith Road where the, the, the spur up to the mill branches off. And so they didn't continue on because then the railway continues on past that and then makes the big loop to come back up the Beauforts. 
But, so they never did the, the tourist train, um, which by the way, the last time it ran, I think it was 2018. Um, hopefully that one runs again sometime in the future. Um, but an interesting thing is, in, and I got this from Maynard Atkinson's book, um, is they did some logging, I think Canadian Pacific, when they owned the right of way, did some logging above McLean Mill that they could easily reach from the ENN railway above McLean Mill, really close to, to one of my trestle photos. Um, and um, so they, they used basically the tourist train locomotive. And one day they actually fired up the number seven steam locomotive. And this is about 2004 or so. And they used it to pull some, um, some logging cars and got some photos from there, which is pretty neat. I mean, according to Maynard's book, which was about the Englewood logging railway up on the North Island, there was kind of that, well, if we just do this for one day, now we'll be the last steam locomotive doing the logging train. Yes. I'm wondering about the, the steel bridges that have been in service for over 100 years, the 1909 steel bridges. Yeah, that's... Now, uh, yeah. I assume they would have had ongoing maintenance of painting and scraping and repainting. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you've ever heard anything about their future viability well, yeah. after 20 years well, of neglect. There's an engineering report that I found fascinating that came out in 2019 where they looked at, at the, the structures to kind of come up with a future plan of this needs to be re rebuilt, this is what needs to be done to get to a new weight level, et cetera. And so, yeah, they would have a finite life. But going to a Robert Turner book, um, he's just got some comments on some of them, like when he talks about the Cowichan Lake, no, the Cowichan River Bridge south of Duncan, um, that some of the metal parts, you know, need, are seized up and stuff like that. Obviously, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you would think there would be maintenance required on, but um, how much, I'm not sure. Mm. Yes, microphone, yeah. The, uh, the long trestle over um, Summit Lake. Yeah. There's a sealed cable running the length of the yeah. trestle. Do you know I, what that's I can, Yeah, I can explain that one. That's a, that's a good common when those started showing up, here we go, let's just go back to Summit Lake. I'll show it to you easier with the, um, the information slide. One moment, please. Comes from the fiber optic cable installation project that was from 2021 to 2022. Oh. There's a view of it going down. They did that on all the trestles during that eight mile section. And so I think best I can gather, the workers for the contractor doing the fiber optic cable project um, it's a job site, so they needed a cable strung out to latch on for safety purposes while they were on these interesting old structures. This one is not very tall, but some of them were, were kind of tall, and so there were um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven of them that they did, and they all have them the same, and I've seen chatter on Facebook if I've posted a photo that happened to have one where people are, that's not fastened correctly at the end. I have no idea. It's kind of like a strung guitar string where if you flick it with your boot, you don't get a tone, but it's, it's, it's pretty tight. But they, I think that's what they did, and they've left them there. So maybe that's for continued maintenance. Um, but yeah. Henry, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, very much. It's always uh, a pleasure to hear someone with enthusiasm yeah. sharing their uh, uh, their joy and their knowledge. Mm -hmm. I'm particularly interested because you're a rail fan that's not concentrating on locos and real cars. Yeah. So it's nice to see the bridges and the trestles, uh, which is something that we can all share. Yeah. So yeah. on behalf of the oh, society, thank you kindly. We like to uh, thank you very much, and uh, maybe if you've got another point of view at some point in the future, come back and talk to us again. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much.